Good afternoon. It looks like they put the lights up to make sure that you're awake. Um, I'm sorry I have a bit of a cold, so I don't know if, I hope my voice will get me through the, the lecture. Now, thank you. Now let's, see how, let's see how many of you are awake. You have been looking at this screen for hours. What's wrong here? Okay, somebody's awake. Good. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, aerosol therapy, inhalers and nebulizers. Um, now, the concept of giving uh, inhaled uh, medications is a very old one. Uh, even uh, people have started uh, asthma cigarettes some centuries ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, nebulizers started appearing in the 19th century. And uh, the first uh, inhaler, the first meter dose inhaler, uh, actually was marketed in 1956. So some uh, fun pictures. Actually, they found this in some... Uh, ancient Egyptian uh, drawings, and it seems that they did have some kind of, of a nebulizer, even in ancient Egypt. And uh, this is really funny, asthma cigarettes. Uh, they used to smoke these things for, for asthmatics. Hopefully, uh, luckily we don't have those things anymore. This is a picture of the very early nebulizers. That's how they looked like. And this is uh, not the actual one. This is a drawing of the first uh, meter dose inhaler that was marketed. So. What is an aerosol? An aerosol is a suspension of a solid or a liquid particle in a gaseous state. The liquid particles uh, could be either in a solution, as in nebulizers, uh, in nebulizer solutions, or in suspicions, uh, such as in meter dose inhalers. And dry powder inhalers are examples of solid particle uh, aerosols. Now, why do we uh, like uh, aerosols? Why do we like to use this method, especially in pulmonary medicine? Um, medication that is delivered directly to the site of action. If you have a problem in your airways, you don't have to go to the stomach through the bloodstream, and then very little of that goes to the bronchi. I can access the bronchi directly through inhalation. So this makes it a very effective way of delivering uh, my drugs to the airways. And also, I protect the rest of the body from you know, being exposed to those medications. Um, it acts very rapidly. And you know, everybody in this room have used salbutamol. And they know that it really acts very rapid. And uh, it's important that it allows use of small doses. So systemic effects are much less. And this is what we do when we use inhaled steroids. We use really small doses so that even though we are using something that has a lot of side effects, but actually we can avoid that by using very small doses. Um, and we avoid the whole thing of GI absorption, absorbed, not absorbed, the first pass metabolism by the liver, we avoid the whole uh, GI system. Now, uh, once you have given um, uh, an nebulizer or an inhaler, uh, it does not mean that uh, automatically it is getting down to the lungs. There are many factors that affects what happens between the device and the airways. Whether uh, you know, you're aiming for the large airways, you're aiming for the small airways, or you're aiming for the alveoli. Uh, so usually only a fraction of the aerosolized dose is ultimately delivered to the lungs. The largest portion of what you, uh, what you give is actually either in the delivery device itself, or goes up in the air, or it gets exhaled. Uh, don't forget that, you know, af even after it goes down to the airways, a portion of that is actually brought up again during exhalation. Uh, deposition happens anywhere in the respiratory tract, in the nose, in the mouth, in the pharynx, in the larynx, or in the upper airway. So, um, you know, sometimes you get deposition in places where you don't really need it or want it. Now, there are many factors that affect this, and it's beyond the, um, this is a very long discussion, but I'm just going to mention uh, a few things. The physical properties of the aerosol, and the most important is the particle size. There are different mechanisms of deposition. Pattern of inhalation is important, and we're going to mention that. And of course, there is intersubject variability, and the presence of airway disease affects that. Um, 
when you want to uh, uh, target the tracheobronchial tree, say like in asthma or airway disease, you want most of your deposition to be here. And this usually corresponds to about two to five micrometers of size. And when drug companies, when they make uh, their inhalers, they usually go for this size. They usually go between two, two and five micrometers uh, to, uh, to deliver uh, to, the, uh, to the airways. A uh, pattern of inhalation is important. Usually you need a deep inspiration. And this is really important, especially in children who are not very cooperative. You don't often get a deep uh, inspiration. Uh, slow inhalation uh, actually decreases the oropharyngeal impaction and is recommended for both nebulizers and meter dose inhaler. While if you are using a dry powder inhaler, uh, like the discus or the turbo inhaler, um, then you need the high inspiratory force to, to really suck the, uh, those powder particles down uh, in, the, uh, in the airways and to disaggregate those particles to your uh, favorable two micrometer size particles. Um, and something that, you know, uh, very rarely I see people do is breath holding at the end of the uh, inspiration. So it is usually recommended once you take your inhaler, especially the, the dry powder inhalers, once you have taken your big deep breath in, you should tell the, the patient to hold the breath for about five seconds so that to allow for the sedimentation of the particles because if you breathe in and you immediately exhale out, many of what you have inhaled in actually will be exhaled out and do, it will not be allowed time to deposit in the lower airways. Now, oftentimes we tell the family that, um, you know, they say, well, when I put the, uh, the nebulizer in his face, the, he starts crying and, you know, we tell her, um, you know what, it's okay. Even if he cries more, he inhales more. Actually, we do tell them that, but scientifically, that's not true. Actually, if you look at lung deposition, this is a crying child, and this is a cooperative child. So a crying child, most of the, what he inhaled from the nebulizer went to the upper airways and where? To the stomach. While a child who was cooperative actually is the one who got a lot more deposition in his lungs. So if you can keep the child quiet and cooperative, that would be better lung deposition for the uh, nebulizer. Now, whether we are going to be able to do that is another story. <laughs> okay. So oftentimes, you know, uh, the families will come to you and she, she says, I'm trying to put the nebulizer on his face. He does not want it. So, you know, we say, okay, so just keep it near, near his face. It's okay. You don't have to have a tight seal on, on his uh, face. Absolutely wrong. So this is, uh, you know, a lung deposition uh, difference between uh, a tight seal uh, face mask. If the mask is one centimeter away from the face, if the mask is two centimeter away from the, from the face. Now, if the nebulizer is here and the, and the patient is here, then it's anybody's guess. So this thing of, you know, just doing like blow-by uh, nebulization is not a very good way. Well, in real clinical life, does it work? Most of the time, yes. You know, someone who's having acute bronchospasm and you hold, you know, the ventilator nebulizer right next to him, most likely he's going to get benefit. But if you want them to get really the best benefit out of, out of the nebulizer, it has to be a tight-fitting mask. Now, uh, we have different uh, delivery systems for the aerosols. Uh, we have nebulizers, and usually when we say nebulizers, there are m three main types. Jet nebulizer is the common nebulizer that we use. Ultrasonic nebulizers are not really widely used, and mesh nebulizers are kind of like the newer, fancier ones that, you know, uh, that are available now. Uh, of course, we have the meter dose inhaler, which is your regular inhaler. Uh, and, of course, always when we say inhalers in children, always we say with spacer. And uh, dry powder inhalers is, uh, is the third type. So this is the thing that everybody knows. You know, this is what we have available in the hospitals. We hook this either to compressed air or to oxygen. And then we put some medicine in there. 
and uh, you know you put the mask on the patient's uh, face or you can have the home device where it's just an air compressor and you can either have it by a mask or you can have it uh, through a, a mouthpiece and some of them even have a nose piece that you can use them it's okay uh, all of them work uh, you know, as long as you are using them uh, properly. So the jet nebulizers are the most common used types. They use the compressed air. They're heavy, they're noisy, but they are the most affordable. That's why most people use that. Now the newer mesh nebulizers uh, use a vibrating uh, plate. It forces the liquid through uh, a plate that has a lot of very small holes in it so that you, know, you get the particles out. And what's nice about that is that you make the whole size of what you want the particle size to be. So this is done you know, uh, by the computer, and it is done by laser. It is very precise. And then you get um, you know, uh, particles that are of your desirable size. It is quite fast. Um, usually, um, you know, uh, a mesh nebulizer would finish the nebulization treatment in about five to seven minutes maximum as opposed to the regular jet nebulizer, which needs about 10 to 15 uh, minutes to finish. Uh, it's a lot quieter than uh, a regular nebulizer, uh, and it is usually a lot smaller and portable. Most of these things are made chargeable. They are either battery operated, or you can just charge them, and you can go around anywhere with them. Of course, they are more expensive. You know, the, the good models that are available in the Jordanian market is between 100 and 150 JDs. There are some, you know, mesh nebulizers in Jordan that run about like 60 or 70, but they are not the best, uh, the best uh, nebulizers. So this is what a, a mesh filter looks like, and those are different types. And look, this is really small. It is really small, and families, they really love it, if they can afford it. <clears throat> now, I want this to be really practical. I don't want to give you a lot of, you know, uh, theoretical stuff. I'm just going to name names, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to have to use trade names uh, for, for the different uh, things. I'm going to show you pictures of the actual inhalers because I think, you know, this is what pediatricians uh, want, want to have. Of course, we can use bronchodilators, inhaled steroids, antibiotics, mucolytics, DNAs, and other things, but the first two are the most commonly used. Of course, our beloved most used uh, uh, inhaled medication is salbutamol or albuterol. Uh, and um, it comes in different forms. Uh, of course, you have the, uh, the meter dose inhaler, which has uh, 100 micrograms, micrograms per puff, and the usual dose is between 2 and 10 puffs every 4 hours PRN. And usually when I put 10, people look at me and say, like, what? 10 puffs every time? Yes, you can use up to 10 puffs every time. And it is absolutely fine. And there are studies, and you are not going to you know, kill him from tachycardia. Relax. Uh, nebulizers. Uh, you know, this is the uh, salbutamol nebulizer solution, the Ventoline solution. And uh, it comes in a concentration of 5 milligram per ml. And you usually use 0.5 ml, which is 2.5 milligrams in a 2.5 ml normal saline. And um, not widely available here is the ready-to-use nebules, uh, but it's available uh, in many countries where, you know, it's just a mixture of this with some saline, and they just put it in, uh, in a small uh, ready-to-use uh, vial. Now, if you add, if you add a ipratropium, you can either use ipratropium alone, uh, which is the atrovent, uh, and it comes as either uh, a nebulizer solution. There is also an atrovent inhaler. We very commonly use this one. We use Combivent. Uh, Combivent is a mixture of uh, ipratropium, 500 micrograms, with a salbutamol of 2.5 milligram, and there is uh, about 2 and 0.25 uh, saline of uh, the total uh, amount of uh, this vial. Um, and usually, a, a very common mistake is that, you know, uh, people don't realize that this is ready to use. It already has the normal saline in there. You do not dilute the combivent uh, vial. You just take it as it is, you just open it, you put it in the nebulizer, and you start it. 
Do I do this for the little kids? Yes. Do I do it for the adults? Yes. It is the same dose for everybody. Don't you know, go crazy, 0.7 ml in whatever. Don't do that, please. It is ready to use vial. Use it for everybody the, the same way. And I have not seen this in a very long time. I think it's not currently available in Amman. Uh, but there is an, uh, a combivent inhaler as well, uh, which has actually a lot less ipratropium uh, in it. Um, now, if we move to inhaled steroids, uh, fluticasone, uh, which is most commonly known as flexotide, um, is a potent low systemic bioavailability uh, steroid. I like it. It is my most commonly used inhaled steroid. If we, if we talk about the inhalers, it comes in three strengths. Uh, the 50, the 125, and the 250. We usually don't use the 250. Uh, and, you know, you can't tell by the color. You don't actually, uh, if, if, you are, if you have seen it many times, you know, uh, this is the light color, this is the intermediate, this is the dark color. So usually once I see it, I can know uh, which strength is the patient uh, using. Uh, it's also available as a discus. I have not seen this in Amman. People don't seem to be using it a lot. And there is also a flexitide uh, nebulizer, actually, uh, which I've seen people coming with uh, from the Gulf region, but I don't think it's available in the Jordanian uh, market. It's available. I have not used it. Um, okay, biclomethazone. Uh, biclomethazone is actually uh, our uh, old, uh, beloved uh, inhaled uh, steroid. It used to be called uh, bicotide. Um, and... Uh, the problem with biclomethazone, it is effective, and there are uh, all the old studies about inhaled steroids actually were done on biclomethazone. It is quite effective, it is great, but there is a problem. It is not as safe as the other ones. Why? Because it has a high systemic bioavailability. It gets absorbed, and especially if you use a high dose. Now, the problem is, uh, I don't know why, uh, the most commonly used uh, uh, dose in the Jordanian market is the 250 microgram dose. This is a huge dose for adults. I've seen kids who are one year old or even less and who are like on two puffs of Clinil 250 twice a day. This is not good, guys. The, the systemic bioavailability when you use this high of a dose of biclomethazone, it is really not safe on the long run. Uh, there is also another newer improved uh, biclomethazone, which is the small particle uh, fancy inhaler. Uh, this is called QVAR in the US, and it actually comes in a 40 and 80 microgram. Why is it such a low dose? Because this is a really small particle, and because of the way it is made, it, is, it really goes down to your lower airways very effectively. So if you use a very effective device, you do not need high doses. And it is found that you know, the, the QVAR, even with low doses, is even better than the traditional inhaler with the higher doses. Uh, Bedozenide, Bedozenide is in the middle. It is of intermediate potency and of intermediate systemic bioavailability. It is pretty good. Um, the most commonly used in, in Jordan is the uh, uh, nebules or respules. Uh, and they, uh, usually we use the one milligram in two ml. This is the one available in Jordanian market. But I want you to know that there is another concentration in other, in, uh, other countries. But in, in Jordan, we only have this concentration. Uh, and there is also the Palmicort uh, Turbohaler, which is a dry powder inhaler and it comes uh, at a dose of 200 micrograms per puff. Now, for the, uh, for the higher potency, now the asthmatics who need something stronger, we use the, ice, the inhaled steroid with long-acting beta agonist uh, combinations. Uh, we have several of those. We have the fluticasone with salmitrol, and it comes in six different uh, forms. There is a meter dose inhaler and there is a, a discus. The meter dose inhaler comes as a 50 and 125 and 250. This is the fluticasone part. The, uh, the salmitrol part is constant, 25, 25, 25. 
and the discus comes as 100, 250, and 500. The other uh, uh, ICS lava combination is, is also commonly uh, comes as a dry powder inhaler, the Symbicord. Uh, the one we commonly use is the 160. This is the one that is most commonly used here. 80 over 4.5, I don't think it's available here. The 320, which is the double dose, this is indicated for COPD. We usually don't use this in pediatric uh, asthma, but it exists and the indication is for use in patients, in adults with COPD. Uh, another combination uh, is biclomethazone with formitrol, which is called Foster. And, uh, whoops, uh, the, uh, the newer one in, uh, in the market is the fluticazone with formitrol. This came out, I think, just a few months ago in the Jordanian market. It is called Flutiform. Uh, and Flutiform comes in a 50, uh, 125, and 250 uh, micrograms of uh, fluticazone. But it is with formitrol, not with uh, salmitrol like this one, but it just works as good. Um, the, new, the new player for, for asthma and for pediatrics is the LAMA. Now, the long-acting muscarinic agent, teotropium, uh, has been used for COPD for quite some time. But then people started looking, does it really help in asthma? And there were studies and then it, in 2015, it was approved in, uh, for adults with asthma. In 2017, it was approved for uh, kids above six years with, with asthma. Um, and it, it was e uh, added to the latest guidelines as an add-on therapy for uncontrolled asthma. Uh, but in pediatrics, we still don't have a lot of experience with this. So this is the new player. And uh, now people are talking about a triple inhaler where you will have uh, the inhaled steroid, the long-acting uh, beta agonist, and the long-acting muscarinic antagonist all in one uh, inhaler. This is going to be for you know, the really bad asthmatics. Um, now, as you see, there is a lot of different devices here. And it has been shown over and over that if you don't use the device properly, you're not going to get the benefit properly, obviously. But this is really, really important. In various studies, uh, poor inhaler technique was estimated to be between, depending on what study you're looking at, between 14 to 90% of people who are using the inhaler were found to use the inhaler improperly. Um, and the average was about at least 50% of you know, the times when people use the inhalers, they don't use it properly. Do you think that we were doing better? Actually, we're not. There was one study of medical interns, and only 5% of those actually were using the inhaler properly. Uh, why is this important? This is important because in children and adolescents, education of proper inhaler use was associated with improved lung function, reduced school absenteeism, decreased number of days with restricted activities, and fewer visits to the emergency room. This is really important, and we should always spend some time, whenever we give one of those inhaler devices, we should spend some time teaching the patient and the families about the proper use of the inhalers. I'm not gonna go through this, but I just want to show you how, thank you. Uh, but I just want to show you how long is the list of different types of errors. And, and look what is the first error, failure to remove the cap. You know how much? 5%, this is not like one in a million thing. 5% of the people using the inhaler did not remove the cap. Do I blame them? I do not blame them. Nobody have shown them the inhaler and said, you have to take this off, and you have to put it like this, and you have to shake it like that, and you have, if nobody showed you, why on earth would he know how to use a device that nobody has taught him how to use it? Now, if you buy a new phone, you know, you spend a very long time, you know, learning how to work the thing. Now, you're using something that's about your health. You should learn how to do that. So, you know, there are all kinds of different uh, errors, you know, uh, not pushing it, not inhaling, not putting it inside your mouth. I mean, all kinds of, like, things that you can imagine, you know, can, can happen. 
And again, I don't blame them. Those are not stupid people, but nobody has taught them how to use it. You sh we should teach them. Even, you know, using it with the spacer, same thing. A lot of kinds of, of errors. You go to dry powder inhalers, very long lists. Dry powder inhalers, very long list. So, you know, those things are not easy. And usually, you know, it is a lot easier actually to teach that meter dose inhaler with a spacer than to, uh, you know, teach the dry powder inhalers. So even though the FDA says that I, uh, I, the dry powder inhalers are approved from like five or six, I don't use them usually below 10. I don't believe that you know, most kids below 10 years of age, they cannot really use the, uh, the DPIs. And actually, many of the teenagers that come to my clinic, and you know, they have been using the Symbicort or the Ceritide or whatever, the Discus or the Terbohaler, and like they are not do, doing a good job, and I look at everything, and you know, everything should be fine. Why is he not controlled? Usually, I do one simple thing. I switch them from the Ceritide Discus to the ceritide inhaler with spacer. One month later, wow, different kid. What happened? They were not taking the medication properly. So now they are taking it properly. So it doesn't matter. I'm not saying that you know one device is better than the other. Please choose whatever device is proper for your uh, patient. And never, ever give uh, uh, a meter dose inhaler to a child, especially below 10, without a spacer. You absolutely must give the meter dose inhaler with a spacer. So always there are different you know, uh, uh, sizes for the little ones, for the toddlers up to five, and this is the large. And you know, after maybe like uh, six or seven years of age, you don't really need the, uh, the mask. You can just tell them to put this mouthpiece inside their mouth, and then they can breathe, and then they can push it and breathe five times. Um, a never-ending um, you know, uh, uh, debate is, you know, nebulizer is better than the inhaler. Now, there are many studies comparing uh, inhalers to nebulizers, whether they are effective or not. Now, Nebulizers are better than inhalers if you're not using inhalers properly. Once you use your inhaler properly, um, you know, this was a Cochrane review in 2013. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, the gist of it. It is just as good, okay? And actually, in some studies, it was even better than nebulizers. With one exception that all these studies have excluded the life-threatening asthma. Of course, if I have, you know, someone who is really, really sick and I'm about to put him on the ventilator, I'm not gonna you know, give him an inhaler. But, you know, even in emergency rooms for, you know, really sick, um, you know, asthmatics who are coming, you know, to be admitted to the ward or you, who need the treatment in the emergency room and they can go home, you do not need a nebulizer. The, if you use the inhaler properly, and by that I mean proper technique and a proper dose. Remember we said two to 10 puffs. Don't ever imagine that, you know, you're gonna give two puffs of the 100 microgram uh, uh, Ventolin inhaler, and this is gonna be equal to the 2.5 milligrams, the 2,500 micrograms that you're putting in the nebulizer. If you want equal effect, you have you know, to use proper dose. So in summary, inhaled medications can be delivered by nebulizers, meter dose inhalers, or dry powder inhalers. A wide variety of inhaled medications, bronchodilators and inhaled steroids are the most common, and inhaler technique errors are common, and education of proper use is vital, and always do not forget the spacer, and thank you very much.